You guys can be seated. So glad that you're in church this morning. Big welcome to anybody who's joining us online. And uh, welcome to our 10 a.m. service. We thought it would be wise with our resource to do a 10 a.m. service since uh, we, I don't know if you've noticed, we do have a few young adults at this church. And we decided that it would be a good idea to run a camp on a Sunday morning and uh, retreat. We keep calling it, it's a camp. They're not here. We can be honest. It's a camp. Uh, no, it's a retreat in case they're watching online. And uh, anyway, we're running that. But I, I, I know even, I just had reports coming in sort of last night and, uh, and yesterday that God is moving and, and touching them. So this is actually probably one of the busy, busiest days of church we've ever had. It's just that half of them are somewhere else. So um, anyway, keep praying that they have some good encounters with God. Guys, we are in week four of a series that we call Devoted. And this series has to do with our relationship with Jesus. It has to do with our relationship with God, with the the Spirit of God. Because all the decisions that we make in life, they flow out of our relationship with God. They do, because you pray about things and you make course corrections and you know, change the direction in your life based on what God speaks to you, based on what God says to you. So being a Christian... Being a Christian is not about being uh, disciplined and it's not about following rules and being rigid in what we do. But, you know, when it comes to being a Christian, to be honest, it's about, it's about your desire. It's about being devoted to God. And like we just said in prayer, when you are devoted to God, it moves his heart. Do you know that? You want to see God really move, right? And you're devoted when you're when you're hungry, hung, hungry, yeah. When you're when you're hungry, someone get me another coffee. And I had to sleep in because it's at 10 a.m. Anyway, but uh, when you're hungry for the presence of God, He moves, and I think that the Spirit moves uh, when He sees how 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 much we really desire Him and His presence. So so we are we are not devoted to rules as Christian people. We are devoted to God. Amen. All right, but because we are devoted to God, we also do what He asks. Amen? That was not as enthusiastic. (laughs) Uh, Look, (laughs) when I I get ready to do a message, there are two types of messages that you could do in church. One One of them is one of those messages where we say, this is what God has done for you. And people are like, ah. And then there's the other type of messages where I say, this is what God wants from you. It's a little bit less enthusiastic. But actually, God does want us to do some things. He does want us to live a certain way. I want to talk about that today. So I'm going to read to you out of 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. It says, for this is the love of God. If you didn't know what it was, here it is. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. So like, ah, I guess we got to do it. Yeah, we got to do it. Yeah, well, well, you know, we love Him. So, all right, fine. Yeah. That, that, that would be to make a burden out of His commandments. So if we were to like summarize what that scripture says, it's like, To love is to obey. Yeah? If you love God, you obey Him. It's kind of a test, isn't it? It's a really easy principle to reverse engineer, right? If you're trying to figure out if you love God, maybe we could just do put that thing in reverse. If you're obeying Him, it's because you love Him. If you are actively disobeying Him, that might tell us something about how much you love God. Now, when it comes to obedience, when it comes to obeying God, it might not surprise you this morning to learn that all of the things God asks us to do is completely motivated by love on His behalf. Every time He asks us to do anything, it's for our benefit, it's for our blessing. So I hope it doesn't surprise anyone that God loves you 
with an intensity. So he sets boundaries and, and, and guides and, and commandments. And these things are there to bless you. Now, should you do it? Absolutely. Can you trust him completely? Why? He loves you. Have you noticed that when you realize someone loves you completely, it's a lot easier to trust them? I'll tell you right now, you can trust God. God says all kinds of things and, you know, we, we need to trust him. Sometimes he's, we feel like he says crazy things, but anything he says is motivated by love. I'll, I'll tell you a story that I heard many years ago. There was a um, man walking down in, in New York City, walking down the street, and God spoke to him and he said, I want you to stand on your head. Now, every now and then you hear something from God and you think, what? That is not from you. That's just me being a wacko. You know, like that, that can't be right. He says, no, God wants you to stand on your head. Or he said, I want you to stand on your head. And he sort of like ummed and ahed about it for a while. But he was like, fine, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll stand on my head. So he goes over to a building and he does like a handstand. But he needs to lean up against the building. And as he does, there's these thin windows along the bottom of the building that allow light into the basement that's, that's below them. And so he stands on his head and as he does, he is face to face with a woman who's looking at him with her eyes wide, like, what is going on, right? It's probably not an unusual thing. It's like, why is this person doing this? But she sort of motions something and she comes up out and speaks to the man. And she said, why did you just do that? He said, well, I know it sounds kind of strange, but I felt like God told me to stand on my head. It's weird. I know. I know. And she goes, yeah. She says, what you probably don't realize is that I just wanted to know if God was real. And I told him that if he was real, that someone needs to come along this street and stand on their head. And if they don't, I'm going to end my life tonight. And we hear crazy things sometimes. And you say, wow, is God in that? And, and, and let me just, you know, asterisk this a little bit. When I put things under the banner of crazy things, those crazy things never conflict with God's word, Okay. Because he always says things that's in alignment in, with his word. So if there was a command that said, thou shalt not a standeth on thy head, then, you know, then that would be something out of, con you know, he, he wouldn't have asked him to do that. But there's no scripture in there. There's a lot of stuff that God asks us to do that is not right or wrong. It's just stuff. But when we hear his voice and we know how to hear his voice, we can respond to it. And I told you it does. It, it blesses the lives of other people. Did you know that God commands us? To live in a certain way, but you get to choose whether you obey. Which is weird. Because he commands us to live a certain way. You are to do this, but then you get to choose whether you do it or not. If you obey the commands of God, it brings blessing into your life and into the lives of other people. If you disobey, it has the opposite impact on your life. Let me give you a, a, an example of this. You would be familiar, all of you, I imagine, with the story of God leading Israel out of Egypt. He leads them out by the prophet Moses, and eventually they get out there, you know, through a few twists and turns in the journey. They're in the wilderness for 40 years, but he's got Israel out of Egypt. He just doesn't have Egypt out of Israel. Because sometimes what happens is people drag their old life into the new life that God is giving them. So God says, all right, well, we're beginning a journey together. We're beginning a new life together. And I'm going to give you some guides, some rules. You're going to change some things that you used to do. We're not going to do that anymore. And he gives Israel the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments was to make sure that they did their life in a different way. They didn't drag their old life into their new life. He says, you're part of my community. We're going to do life a little bit differently. If you take those Ten Commandments and you divide them into two categories, which you can do, half of them have to do with God and half of them have to do with people. One day a lawyer came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, hey, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments in two categories. And he says, you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all your soul and all of your mind, right? And he says, the other commandment is like that one. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you got to be in community to do that, don't you? you got to be connected to people to do that. 
We live in a very individualistic society and, and culture, especially in Western culture. I feel like it would be, uh, you know, more comfortable for some people to believe that the summary of that would be to love the Lord God with all of your soul and to love yourself. But it talks about loving your neighbor. Like, that's pretty interesting. I think God's idea is this. If you love him, you will be devoted to what he asks, right? If you love him, you'll be devoted to what he asks. Now, half of the 10 commandments have to do with how we interact with each other. Guys, half. Half. Half is to do with God. Half is to do with community. And not just any community, but His community. Half of the things that we are supposed to do have to do with how we interact with each other. Why? Because God's people were never called They were never commanded. They were never designed to follow him alone. We're meant to do it together. We're meant to do it together. When I was younger, I remember going on bushwalks with my family. And for whatever reason, my brother and I, my younger brother, we always had to be in front right? Not in front of each other. We could accept that. We just walk side by side, but we absolutely had to be in front of the rest of the family. And we would just kind of walk off on them. And so, you know, mum and dad would say things like, hey, don't go further than we can see. Don't go around that corner. Like, wait for us, you know, but we were always wanting to, 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 to be ahead of them. And, you know, to the untrained eye, if we were walking along that you know, going bushwalking and somebody's walking the other direction and they see us, they go, oh, look, just two small children walking through the bush. <laughs> all alone, all alone. You know, until they maybe get a kilometre down the trail and find the rest of the family. Like, oh, are they with you? Oh, I didn't. It's just that they look like they were walking by themselves. They look like they were all alone. You know what made us look like we were by ourselves? We put such distance between us and the rest of our family. How many people that follow God put distance between themselves and God's family? And to the untrained eye, they're like, oh, you don't have a church. Oh, you don't have a church family. You just do life by yourself. You just do life alone. And I guess they would say, oh, no, we're part of the the wider, you know, official church family. Sure, by association, it's just that you're not walking together. You just sort of walk alone. Here's my question to you. Um, Can you walk alone and be part of God's family? Can you walk alone and be part of God's family? It's weird, like... No, yes, sort of, uh, but not really. You'll be able to do half of the Ten Commandments well, but you won't be able to do the other half. Because the other half, which are commandments, (laughs) require you to be in community so you can do it. Otherwise, how else are you supposed to fulfill the things that God's got you to do if you keep doing it alone? Is being part of a church, is that, is that important? Is being part of a church, no, let, scrap that, Tr- let's try this. Is being part of the church a request or is it a commandment? And every time we get to that, anybody that ever says, yeah, but do you have to? Just know something about the person that asked that question. They're trying to get out of it. (laughs) There's only one reason why you ask that question. Whenever anybody says, do you have to? Those are the people that love God like it's discipline. Do I have to pray? What? No one that's devoted asks that kind of question. They're like, prayer is the best. Do I have to go to church? No one that's devoted says that. They say going to church is the best. 
They love it. You couldn't stop them. They want to be here. They were at all services. It's like you really don't need to be at all services. Anybody that's trying to ask that question, they're just trying to get out of something, you know. So, so you know, and I would add this. Even if you could answer that question, and I, we're going to answer it today, but even if you could, does it really make a difference? If you love God, don't you just do what he asks? Like, why try to look for loopholes to get out of God's purpose for your life? Why don't try to look for loopholes to get out of what God actually wants you to do with your life? You know, when we read the, the scriptures, we read about the birth of the church. And man, was it, ex- was it exciting. It was so exciting. And every church that's ever read the book of Acts, I'm talking about your local church now. Nearly every church says, wouldn't it be great to be an Acts church? to church. If you've read the scripture, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you have read Acts chapter 2? All right. So most of you know what I'm talking about. But it's the birth of the church. And the church kind of explodes onto this scene. I want to read part of that scripture, Acts 2.42. The, the title of this section says, The Fellowship of the Believers. It says, And they devoted themselves Hey, one of the things I've learned about being a pastor is I cannot devote other people. If I could, ooh, I tell you right now, there'd be no gaps in our team because I would just go ahead and devote you. I devote you and you and you and you. I just devote everyone, right? I, I, we'll find a job for you. But unfortunately in church, you, you know, well, maybe unfortunately for me, maybe not for you, I don't know. But anyway, I can't devote anyone. And, and, and when the church began... They devoted themselves. It says to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship. So here we go. We got, we, what are they doing? They're coming maybe to church, the temple we'll call it. They're hearing teaching and then to fellowship. They're actually connecting. It says to the breaking of bread and to prayers. You know what's interesting about this scripture is apart from the teaching, they, de- they devoted themselves to fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Those things are only possible in community and this is a herald of the church acts 2 oh amazing yeah but look at the ingredients that that we mix together to make this thing be unbelievable they devoted themselves the word church is this word ecclesia and it actually means community sure it means a, a specific community it means god's community he's called out people but essentially it means community. Guys, the word church, right, which is his people, means community. Yeah. Guys, it's in our DNA. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's who we are. You actually can't separate church from community. That would be weird and totally dysfunctional yeah. because the word means community. It would be like me saying to you, can you do community alone? And you trying to say, I think I can manage that. No, you can't. (laughs) It doesn't even work. Logically, it doesn't even make sense. Do Christians need a church? Wrong question. Wrong question. Christians are the church. Let's just, (laughs) hey, if if we're gonna build our life on the word of God, let's start with some foundations from which to build upon. Christians are the church. What would Jesus say to Christians who do life alone? He'd say, what are you doing? I, I think he'd say, what, what, what is wrong with you? Like, do you know it can get better than this? It can get better than doing it alone? Well, you, you actually need each other. This is what Jesus would say. And he does many times in his word, right? You actually need each other. Because you can't be all things to all people. It might surprise you to discover that Jesus divides people, humans, into two categories. The church and the world. That's all he says. The church and the world. Or, if you want another couple of categories, sheep and goats. Church and world, sheep and goats. It's not like he says, but there's this middle section where the pigs and the chickens, you know, like, yeah, you're not quite sure what you are. You're on a journey, man, trying to figure it out. He says, no, sheep or goats. Listen, you're either going to be in one pen or you're going to be in the other. 
Just just choose which. You're either in the world, right? You're, you're, you're either or of the world or, or you're part of the church. But guys, if you're in, get in. And he says to the people that are meant to be in, he says, I'm going to give you an 11th commandment because we've talked all about the 10 commandments, half to do with God, half to do with people. Now, here's what's really interesting. The 11th commandment might tip the scales in one certain direction, depending on what that commandment is. Some of you are looking at me going, there's no 11th commandment. Oh, yes, there is. Are you ready? Come on, let's read it together. John 13, 34. This is the 11th commandment. What does Jesus say? I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Now, how are you supposed to do that alone? This is now a total of six commandments from God that you could not do if you're doing it isolated. Six commandments from God. Now, if you're hearing this the wrong way, you're like, it sounds like he's saying we have to do this. No, that would be the opposite of this series, okay? If you've been tracking with us so far for the past three weeks and you've caught on to today, what I'm saying is if you're devoted to God, you're like, yeah, I really want that. I'd love to have that. I'd love to be part of community, right? You're devoted to God. You're devoted to, there you go, community, people, insert any answer that you like. As long as it's to do with other Christians, I'll be okay. I'll accept that answer. See, here's the thing. You could be saved, baptized, prayer warrior, Bible scholar. Amazing, right? But you still don't walk with your family. And how is that supposed to work? The Apostle Paul said this in Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. He said, and let us consider, which really sounds like, hey, we should talk about this, guys. Let's let's talk about it. Let's consider this. Let's consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You know, when we get together, we stir each other up towards the right things. Stir it up. Stir it up. How do you stir it up? A word of encouragement, a word of prophecy. Maybe sometimes it's just putting your arm around someone, right? Come on. You know what I love about church is that it often, I think people got the wrong idea about church. Church is often people coming around others and saying, come on, man, you're better than this. You know, come on, come on, let's, let's do this together. Come on, you're, you're going to get past this and I'm going to stand with you. And come on, we're, we're going to do this together. You don't have to do this on your own. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I can't understand why anyone wouldn't want to be part of that. It says, let us stir each other up, one another to love and good works, can't do that at a distance, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is the day Jesus comes back. Look forward to the future and imagine if Jesus came back today, would you have stuff still undone? You're like, well, I was going to do it. I didn't expect you at this hour. <laughs> He'll be like, well, I told you to, you know, to think like that. Like, let's, let's work like Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Let's live, you know, let's love like Jesus is coming back tomorrow because none of us really know. Do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. You can't do this on your own. You can't do that on your own. I remember when I was in high school and uh, my my class, we had to get our bronze medallion, and, which is a, a swimming thing. And it's like you had to be able to rescue people. And Anyway, so then to do that, you had to, you know, tow people the full length of an Olympic pool. And so they'd teach you the technique and all the rest, but you've got to be able to do it and they're watching you. <laughs> so I was standing next to a, a friend of mine. And they said, all right, everybody, get into pairs, right? And immediately I thought, no, nah, can't do that, mate. I, I love you, but nah, you know, I, I was looking for someone small and thin, <laughs> right? My friend had a good couple of inches on me. He, he was like bigger than me. And guys, he was a lot heavier than me, like a lot heavier than me, right? I've got to tow this guy. Does someone else can rescue you, mate. I need someone. I need to rescue someone small, right? But you know what happens, right? They say, all right, get into pairs. And he's like, oh, let's be partners. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that, all right, fine, let's do it. You know, all right, I can't get out of this, right? So, so him rescuing me, fine, no problem. <sighs> me rescuing him, what a disaster. 
I, I, I start, and I said to this guy, because I didn't want to fail this, and the person that you're rescuing, which they were told, right, you're only allowed to float. So I had a little whisper in his ear. I said, I don't care what those people said. If you don't kick, I'm telling you, I, I, I will end you, all right? So, like, you... You better kick. I want to see hands moving, right? Like that. Do it on the side that they can't see. I don't care. But I'm not failing this because I have to lug you all the way to the end of the pool, right? Do you know what, guys? Honestly, it was hard work. I was kicking like crazy. I'm puffing, you know, and I'm, I'm dragging him up the pool. Keep, work harder, man. Work harder. Come on. We have got to do this, right? Can I tell you, right? It's really hard work when you're trying to save people all by yourself. It's really hard work when you're the only one doing all the lifting, when you're the only one doing all the work. You know, do you know what it would have been so much easier if I could have just called a couple of the guys over and said, hey, listen, you come on, come help, you know, and, and they came over and like we took a limb each maybe and, and, and dragged him up the pool together. Five of us, five of us. Gosh, that would have been helpful, right? It was just me, you know. Man, that's what the church is like. You're trying to do all the work by yourself. Trying to think that you have to be all things to all people. Gosh, it just doesn't make sense to me. All right, let's just imagine for a moment. Let's say that you've been reaching out to a friend of yours and you lead them to Jesus. Firstly, that is great news. Like awesome for them. Um, you know, great that they, that they know Jesus, right? But guys, it doesn't end there. Like when, when somebody gives their life to Jesus, they're not crossing the um, finish line. That's the starting line of the rest of their life, right? So when we lead people to Jesus, what needs to happen next? Oh, the, well, they need to be discipled, right? Well, that's fine, but what if their calling and their gift and their grace is in an area that you're not called, gifted, or graced in? How are you supposed to be all things to all people? How are you supposed to mentor people in an area that's really, like you can turn your hand to it, but it's not really your grace or it's not really your gift. But you come to the church and there's people everywhere, people that, that are gifted and graced and called in different areas. And you're like, look, I could try to help you, but you know, you should get around them and you should get around them and you should get around them because they're really good. I feel like there's a calling on your life for worship. So look, I, I think you need to join the creative team. I can't sing, but they can. I can't train you, but they know what they're doing, you know. And, and, and so if you get them using their gift and their grace, it just drives them more into the presence of God. Because when you use what you're gifted, called to, and graced at, if you feel like you're worshiping God when you do it, it's beautiful, right? But how are you supposed to mentor every single person in every field? You know, unless you are on your own, the fullness of the body of Christ... And if you think that, we're going to cast something out after the service, right? <laughs> Unless you are the fullness of the body of Christ all on your own, you know what? You're going to need the church. You're going to need the church because we're not supposed to do it on our own. Acts 2, 46 to 47. This is the continuation of the birth of the church. It says this in chapter 46. Still under the banner of the fellowship of the believers. It says, and day by day, that sounds frequent to me, attending the temple together, which is kind of like services, I guess, and breaking bread in their homes, which is kind of like small groups, I guess. Yeah. It's not rocket science, is it? They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The church is God's plan to change the world. He's not doing it through any other organization on the planet. He's doing it through the church, which is awesome. Yes? Cool. It's very, very good. But it does get a little bit challenging when we've got a finger over there. We've got an eyeball that's rolling around in the street by itself. You know, saying, I'm fine, but they're not fine because they can't even get out of the gut. They're just an eyeball, <laughs> right? It's just an eye. Like, all right, look, when you see someone, let's imagine your spouse, you look into their eyes. You're like, you have beautiful eyes, right? Okay, but pluck that thing out and put it somewhere else. It's like, that is disgusting. <laughs> I know. When you, when, 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 you, when you cut off the individual pieces, right, and put them in different places, it's disgusting, isn't it, you know? And, 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 and meanwhile, the eyeball is rolling around the street saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's like, you are not okay. 
if you only had a body. Uh, if you were only connected to it, if you were inside somebody's head, you would look beautiful. But right now, honestly, you're making us sick, right? And, 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 and I'm making a pretty good point here, probably the same point that Paul made, right? Which is when all the pieces are separate, it's disgusting when they're all cut up in other places. That's like, well, that's just wrong, okay? But, but, but when it's all together and living and functioning and moving as one, do you know what the, do you know what the Bible would call that? We call that unity. Because everything's moving in one direction. Everything's right. You know, if we don't have hands, we're trying to pick people up and help them. But if you don't have an arm, it's a little bit difficult. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's like we actually need all the pieces to function together so that it can be powerful and effective. And man, I'll tell you right now, the church is powerful and effective when people just get past all their individualistic stuff and say, I'm prepared to be devoted to you and to lay down my life, I want to love you and I want to love your people and I'm going to do it this way and I'm going to do it that way. It's beautiful when it all comes together. You see, devotion and unity go hand in hand. They're a package deal. They come together. I think that's why the church was meeting all the time. The early church had incredible unity. Man, they were passionate. They were just so excited about what God was doing. They'd never seen anything like it. It's probably why all Christians, just repeat that back to me, all Christians. It's probably why all Christians are commanded to be in church. Now, I just said in church, and some of you are still thinking, right, attending services is what he's talking about. Well, maybe that's part of it. But church is community. Right? All right? So you're commanded to be in fellowship, in community, in connection with other believers. It's a commandment of God. Don't do it on your own. You know, as a church, we have small groups. It, it wasn't rocket science. We, it, was, it was a very biblical thing. Temple, house to house. So what church services small groups meet house to house small groups are awesome small groups are where you get pastored small groups are where you find connection small groups are where you build relationship you know whenever anything goes wrong in somebody's life and we hear about it in church oh this person just is going through a terrible thing that person just got a terrible diagnosis one of the first things that I say to our leaders are, whose small group are they in? That's what I say. Because, you know, I love you. Pray for you. I love the church. And I care for the church. I just recognize that I can't be all things to the church. So I want to make sure that people are loved and cared for and looked after. So my first port of call is, great, which small group are they in? Because I just feel like if somebody is in a small group, they're going to be looked after. If somebody is in a small group, they're going to be connected. You know, and, and I think, great, their small group has got them like, let's make sure that we're on top of this as well. You know, we don't want to not be on top of their scenario or what they're going through. Come on, let's pray together. But at least I know that if they're a small group, they're sending flowers and they're cooking meals. Don't do life on your own. You know, I, I love church. I, but in this environment, in all honesty, it's not the kind of environment where everybody raises their hand, we ask questions and we're answering questions from here. We're doing a service, right? But in small groups, it's like, hey, let's break this down. Let's talk about this. Let's try to understand this. You know, and that's why we do small groups. Do you know, in our church, we have probably, despite the fact that we probably mention it in church every single week, maybe half of our adults above the age of 18, maybe half of our adults, I think maybe just over half, are actually in a small group. Don't do life on your own. It doesn't work. I, I feel like, in all honesty, sometimes, this is probably the most dangerous scenario. Let's try it on. You've been in church for a really long time. You've become overly familiar with these types of things. Ah, small group, yeah. You're so familiar with it, 
you, you've, you've lost your awe for God, maybe. Maybe your heart has even grown cold, right? You've, you've lost your vision for church and, and, and what it can do. Don't, don't do life on your own. Don't, don't grow so accustomed to these things that we talk about. It's biblical. Six of the commandments out of the 10 that we know of, that we are told are straight up commandments that sit outside of the law of Moses are to do with connecting with people. How else are you supposed to do all of these things? I don't know. If, if, if church community is an optional extra, just go back and read your Bible all over again. I challenge you to read the New Testament and then come to the same conclusion because I don't reckon that you'll be able to do that. My wife and I love to go to the shops and walk around. One of the things that I've discovered is that the pace at which I walk is faster than Sarah, right? I'm taller, I have longer legs, and I probably just walk faster. Yeah. So there would be moments where we would start walking somewhere, and it's only the two of us, right? And I realize that she's like five feet away, and I stop and, and wait for her to, to catch up. To the untrained eye, I'm... I'm just this guy walking alone. She's just this lady walking alone. But we're, we're, we're meant to be walking together. And so what kind, of, what kind of partner, what kind of spouse would just walk off on their wife or walk off on their husband, right? But I, naturally, I keep a faster pace, right? And if I go by myself, I can go faster. Have you ever heard that, that phrase, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's always better with other people, right? So, so I've discovered a little tip, hot tip. Every married person may thank me for this in just a moment, right? But the way that I naturally slow myself down to walk at her pace and her speed is to hold her hand. And if I hold her hand, I'll, I'll work at her pace or I'll pull her along. It doesn't matter. We go together. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter, right? But at least we're not separated. <laughs> you know what? I do wonder if more people that we're meant to be part of the church, walked with the bride, whether we would walk faster together. Maybe we would. Maybe we'd take more kingdom territory. Maybe we'd take greater ground. Maybe we'd see the gospel advance in a, in a greater way instead of being separated here, there. And, you know, you know here's the thing. You've got to walk with the bride. The bride is the church. The groom is Jesus. He, he wants to walk with us. And we're supposed to be walking together. Come on, look, everybody knows that the church, it's not perfect, but, you know, hang in there. God is working on it. He's perfecting His bride. He's making it beautiful. And, you know, I think it actually looks more beautiful with your inclusion than when you're separated. Remember we talked, separate pieces? Ugh. Together, oh, beautiful. It's unified. It's walking together. Why, why is any of this import, important? Because we were never called commanded or designed to worship God alone. We're not supposed to do it alone. We're supposed to be doing it together. So here's the response today. No special spiritual moment where you have encounter to change this, right? You know what it takes? You. To just go, all right, I get it. I'm in. That's all it is. It means like, honestly, in all honesty, this is the greatest response that you could have to, to, to hearing God's word is to say, all right, then I'm going to get connected. I'll join a small group. I'll be part of a team. I'll do something. Why? Right. Because Pastor Ben told us that we have to. <laughs> no, no. You, you, you missed the point of the last four weeks if you think that. I just think that, you know, when you're, when you're talking to someone that's devoted to God, you, you don't, you're not convincing them of anything. When, when you're talking to someone that's, that's completely devoted to God, they just want to do this. Does that make sense? Come on, stand to your feet. I want to pray for everyone this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just raise your hands this morning as we pray. Father God, I just thank you for every single person that's in here today. I thank you, God, for their gifts, their call, their grace. I thank you, Lord, that you love them. I thank you, God, that every single person in here that calls you Lord and Savior is part of your body. And I pray, God, 
that we wouldn't have a peace over here and a peace over there. And God, that we wouldn't be separated over a great distance so that we're doing our life alone and feeling like we come under the banner of church. I just think that that is a dysfunctional approach to what you've called us to do. So God, for some of us this morning, what that means is we need to repent, which means that we turn around, just stop walking that way. We're not meant to walk alone. We're meant to walk together. And I pray, God, that we would learn from you, from your word, from your commandments, because we're devoted to you. We're going to obey them because to obey them is to love you. And since we love you, God, I pray that every single person in here would devote themselves, not just to the things that you say in your word, but to each other, not just to loving you, but to loving each other, to being in community, to imparting something into another person's life, to contributing in some way, some shape, some form, because God, we understand that as your church, we are never called, we are never commanded, we are not designed to do life alone. And Father, we, we pray together that as we, as we, even as we say this, we, we're going to do life together in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed for one minute. If you were here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, I'll tell you one thing right now. God loves you with an intensity that is so difficult to communicate, but it is crystallized in the gospel, which is that God sent His only Son to die on a cross, to literally die on a cross, to pay the penalty for all of your mistakes. And if you want your sin to be forgiven, if you want a fresh start with God, then all you have to do is ask Him for it. And that is most aptly spoken in a prayer where you say, God, I want to be forgiven for my sin. I want to know you as my Lord and Savior. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, but today you know that that's true. And today is the day that you're meant to make that decision. Just slip up your hand right now and say, I am going to make that decision today. Say, that's it. I'm following Jesus. And if you're watching at home, you do exactly the same thing wherever you are today and say, that's it. I'm making a decision. Amen. Awesome. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together so that the people that are saying that, they don't have to say it on their own. You ready? Come on, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you died on the cross for my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Saviour, and I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and gave God some praise. Come on, let's worship. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.